public session of the Justice Committee, so you're all very welcome. Um, if members can do the needful with any electronic devices, then now would be the time to do it. If there's any um, financial or other relevant interest related to the papers today, now is the appropriate time to declare it. Okay, if not, then if members are content, we will record the oral evidence sessions um, by Hansard. There's apologies from Gemma Dolan, and I'll just ask the clerk to advise members if any have indicated the, a delegation of their authority to vote under the relevant standing order. Thank you, Chair. I can confirm that Gemma Dolan has delegated her vote um, under standing order 1156 to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. Item 3, then, is the draft minutes of the meeting meeting held on the 11th of uh, February. If uh, members are content that they're a true reflection, then I will sign them accordingly. Members Please. content? Yeah. Thank you. Some matters are rising, um, and if Rachel and Gordon could just lower their hand, and then I'll... That would be great. Um, matters are rising. Committee forward work programme, February and March. Uh, there's an updated committee work programme for February and March, reflecting on the work items that were agreed at our last week's meeting. They're at pages 30 to 36 of the meeting pack for your information. Item two is the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill. Uh, Victim Support NI has provided a written submission on the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill. Um, they apologised for missing the closing date of it, but that submission is on pages 3 to 6 of the table pack, and it's going to be added to the bill web page and the electronic bill pack. Uh, and issues highlighted are going to be then added to the summary of evidence that will go to the department for a written response in respect of that. Um, during the oral evidence sessions on the committal reform bill last week, case management in relation to reducing avoidable delay and how this may be better undertaken in the High Court was raised, and whether this would be a more appropriate approach than introducing statutory custody time limits and statutory case time limits was also discussed. So, members, it's just to advise members that um, previously, when this area was looked at, clauses 91 and 92 of the Justice Northern Ireland Act 2015 provided for case management regulations in relation to the management and conduct of criminal proceedings in the Crown Court or a magistrate's court, including imposing duties on the court, the prosecution and the defence. The relevant clauses, which were commenced on 31 October of 2016, and the extract from the Committee Bill Report is at pages 7 to 16 of the table pack. So if members are agreed, we will write to the Department. We will request information on any analysis that has been carried out on what impact these regulations have had on speeding up the progress of cases through the system and, in particular, indictable offences. Um, so I know, members, this issue wasn't raised in the collection of written evidence that we have received, but it is an area we have touched on. Um, and so I think it is important that we would lift that out from a previous piece of work that the, the Justice Committee had carried out in that mandate and include it in the uh, request for information that we are going to be seeking from the Department in line with all of the other now evidence sessions and the written evidence sessions that we have received. So if members are agreed, um, that will form part of the summary of evidence that we want to get clarity from from the Department of Justice. Okay, member is content. Um, yeah. Item three is then the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme. The Department has provided an update on the current position regarding progress to put in place the necessary administrative arrangements for the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme and what consideration has been given to identifying future funding for that scheme. The correspondence is at pages 17 to 21 of your table pack. The Department has indicated that good progress is continuing and it is optimistic that the deadline for the scheme to be ready uh, to open for applications in March will be met. This, however, is reliant on things progressing smoothly in the interim and a number of operational challenges remain. It is therefore not possible at this stage to confirm with certainty that all of the necessary arrangements will be in place to allow the scheme to open for applications in March. And The Victims Payments Board also has an important role to play in confirming approval for the scheme to open for applications. Sounds like someone's got an old style kettle. That's actually what I thought earlier on. Either that or somebody lives in a flight path. <laughs> um, the department has also outlined that uh, funding for payments has not yet been secured, but it is hoped that a meeting with the Secretary of State will be arranged soon to provide clarity 
on this issue. So, members, it's there in terms of up, uh, noting the current uh, updated position on that. If members are content, we will write to the department um, asking that they do inform us if there is going to be any delay to the March timescale for arrangements to be in place, just in light of some of that information that's been provided. Chair, can I also yes, suggest Linda that we Dillon. ask for an update on if that meeting is happening, if there's a date set for it, or maybe by the time they respond it will have happened, but just an update on that meeting around funding and finance, because the rest of it's sorted. Yeah. You know, that that's where the problem lies, and, and we need to get some kind of resolution and, and assurance around that. Yeah. Because it will have big implications for the entire executive if, if we don't get some. Yeah. From yeah, I certainly would echo what Linda has said there and agree that we need to get something nailed down with regards to the Secretary of State. Um, but having said that, having looked through the budget submissions, there is nobody putting in a bid or allocations for this funding. Now, I get that that could be political positioning in light of a meeting with the Secretary of State, but there is a duty on the executive, a legal duty on the executive to do this. Uh, to pay this out, one way or the other, they are the vehicle for which this money must get down to the pen the, the, the pension must get down to the victims. Uh, so I am very concerned that there seems to be, whilst there's bids and money allocated for the infrastructure and the admin uh, of the fund, there is there are no there is no money or funding, pure pounds and pence for actually allocation of a pension to anyone uh, and if they're going to be in place for March well then that's this financial year not next but there doesn't seem to be even bids for next year in anybody's budget line whether it be Department of Justice or Executive Office or Department of Finance for that matter so you know, I think there has to be certainty shown here and, and a confidence shown Given in light of the legal determination a number of weeks ago, I think there has to be assurance given now. Uh, and then, if, well, you see, the problem is that I have is that if this pension is to be paid out to, to a lot of people, more, not only in Northern Ireland but in the wider UK, if you like, and probably further afield for that matter, uh, well then I do believe, of course I believe, that the onus should be on the Secretary of State, the NIO and the or manages his government, um, but the executive is still going to be the funding vehicle. So whether we get money from the Secretary of State in March of this year, or in July of this year, or November of this year, this money is due to these victims, and it must be delivered. I'll leave it there. Sinead Bradley. No. Sorry, Sinead. Mute. If, you can, if you can just unmute. So good as well. <laughs> Tara, thank you. No, I just I want to thank colleagues for their comments on this so far because you know I think this is one item on this committee where we can come together and express our absolute disappointment um, that something hasn't been formed up to date at the, you know, in terms of the way forward on this. And whilst we should and can ask uh, questions about how it's being handled. I would attach to that an expression of our disappointment and frustration um, if others were agreeable to that, because I think it is one of those things we could we could rally behind in, in number. Thank you, Chair. Okay, well, we'll add, uh, sorry, um, Doug, Doug Beattie. Sure, thank you very, 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 very briefly, if I can. Um, is there any way we can write to the Finance Minister um, regardless of, of where this is all coming from, we're, we're likely to hand money back at the end of this financial year. Um, and I've asked this question, has the Finance Minister asked to carry monies over for this specific reason to cover the pension for the first year? Can we write to the Finance Minister and ask him if he has? And if he hasn't, why is he not asked to carry money over from the Treasury for, for this particular issue? Yeah, well, listen, we, we can always ask the Finance Committee or uh, the Finance Minister in respect of um, that issue. I, I, I have no problem in putting that to the committee in terms of trying to get more clarity around that. So, 
on yep, that a Paul. point of information on Doug's point. So I raised, I've raised this numerous times over the last number of weeks in the Finance Committee, and uh, I, I uh, addressed that issue to financial finance officials yesterday. And at the minute, they're sitting with about three hundred million pounds ready to be handed back, which they thought they could keep, but looks like they're going to have to hand back two hundred forty-nine of that as resource. Um, but the reason why they're having to hand it back now, having thought that they could hold on to it, is because of this three hundred million that's just arose out of Barnet Consequentials that has been a, if you like, a, a levelling up that we have received only as the last number of weeks. And because it's such a short duration to the end of the financial year, we're now allowed to carry forward that three hundred new money, three hundred million pounds new money. But the, it looks like if we do not allocate the three hundred million pounds and two hundred forty nine of that as resource, if we do not allocate that in this financial year, then that will have to go back. So you'll get a scenario where you're ha you're getting three hundred hundred million, but you're having to hand back some money. It could be up to that three hundred million, but. They need to have not only shovel-ready projects, but money that can be accounted and accountable, or projects that can be accounted and accountable in pounds and pence. And they're saying that because they have no yet, they have not yet worked out the actual amounts of money that needs and is required for the pension scheme, then they cannot allocate that old money, the 249 old resource money, if you like. They might be able to do something with the 300 million new money that they will be able to carry forward. But again, to me, there's a politi political judgment here as to not to allocate any money in the hope that the Her Majesty's government steps up with additional money for the scheme. And whilst that's a political position, I believe, it's not helping the victims out there. And that's my problem. Yeah, well, I, I, I take the point on this that if there isn't a, a scheme up and running and applications in assessed and approved, you can't. You know, it's pretty difficult to allocate funding uh, in the absence of that, um, and therein lies the issue around um, this scheme not coming online until March, and therefore um, there isn't um, successful applicants to to be in receipt of this at this stage of the financial year. Um, so, notwithstanding the kind of perception as to how that will be seen by victims. Um, but for fear of turning this into the Finance Committee, mm -hmm. um, I, I think we, we will raise point. the issue that Linda had mentioned in terms of the, the wider um, issue around um, the Secretary of State uh, in terms of that meeting. Uh, and again, I'm happy that we would include in that letter to the Department of Justice um, the, in, you know, the further engagement with the Minister for Finance in respect of trying to identify funding. Um, whether that's this year or next year, but I accept the constraints that exist in respect of that. Members happy? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, item five then is the stock take of policing oversight. Um, so officials are attending the meeting today via Starleaf to outline the key issues covered in the department's discussion paper on the stock take of policing oversight and accountability, which have been highlighted by stakeholders for potential consideration. Um, so I should be able to welcome Moira Campbell, head of uh, Policing Policy and Strategy Division and Lisa Bowl in the Policing Policy Strategy Division, both from the Department of Justice. Um, you're welcome to the meeting. Um, so I'm going to hand over to yourselves um, at this stage if you're able to give us a, an outline of the presentation. Thank you. If I can just check if the officials are able to hear us in the Department of Justice. No. Okay. Well, listen, while that technical problem gets dealt with, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, the damages return on investment bill. Um, so, members, pages 150 to 265 of your meeting pack and the relevant papers then of 23 and 25 in your table pack is a further letter from the Minister for Justice. So, following the attendance of the Minister and officials at the meeting on the 28th of January, 
to outline the reasons for seeking accelerated passage for the damages return on investment bill and provide an overview of the content of the bill. The committee agreed to write to the minister providing a summary of the views expressed by members on the proposals. The committee also agreed to write to the Minister of Finance to ascertain if the wider financial implications for the executive and government departments of the proposed new framework have been considered and assessed by ministers. The minister replied to the committee's letter on the 10th of February, providing a range of additional information and indicating that she hoped that this information would reassure members regarding the model provided for in the bill and that members would support her efforts to ensure that the legislation is passed through the Assembly by summer recess. The Minister has sent a further letter indicating the Executive has agreed to the introduction of the damages bill uh, with a condensed committee stage. Uh, I was not aware the Executive had that power, but nevertheless, um, that it would need to conclude by the 30th of April for the bill to pass all its stages before summer recess. The Minister has also provided an indicative timeline which would provide for 21 working days for the committee stage, based on the expectation that the bill would be introduced to the Assembly on 1 March. So at this stage, I am going to ask the committee clerk to take us through what the implications would be in, for this committee in terms of uh, complying with the Executive's uh, decision in respect of this matter. Okay, thank you, Chairperson. Um, I suppose the first thing to say to the committee is that um, there's been, I think, only one occasion where a committee has um, completed a committee stage in 30 days. And when I say completed, they produced a report basically that said that they weren't able to undertake the scrutiny because they simply didn't have enough time to gather the evidence they required, scrutinise it, um, and reach an opinion on the bill. And that situation arose. Um, in relation to the committee um, agreeing to do everything they could to complete the committee stage in 30 days because the bill was coming at the end of a mandate. Um, but um, it did flag up at that stage that it may not be able to do so, um, and halfway through said they needed an extension, but the Assembly refused the extension. So that was the position. So there's really um, no examples of committees being able to complete a full committee stage in 30 days. Um, I think it's just worth highlighting there are a number of risks and difficulties if the committee does wish to take this approach. Um, first of all, there's a high risk to your ability to undertake adequate scrutiny. Um, I think most of the time when you go through bill stages, it becomes clear while you're working through it whether there are issues to explore and what you need to look at. Um, they're not always evident at the start. And when you commit to such a tight time scale, the likelihood is you won't have um, time to fully explore those um, issues if they do arise. Um, and the other thing I would highlight is simply holding additional meetings um, of the committee really just adds more pressure on the staff to service meetings, produce agendas, produce packs, um, and actually reduces the time that we would have to work on papers um, and the draft report. So the solution isn't necessarily just trying to, to hold more meetings, like two meetings or three meetings a week. Um, and to be honest, that would be really difficult in the current circumstances, um, because we don't have the facilities um, to run additional committee meetings that can be broadcast, which is required for legislation, etc. Um, just in the climate we're in at the minute. Um, if you were to decide to go for um, such a time scale as is being proposed, um, I think it's just worth going running through the sort um, of timetable that you would be looking at. Um, you're likely to have less than 10 days to get the written evidence in, um, and we would need to agree to request that before, well before the committee stage even starts. You're likely to have, once you get the written evidence, probably about four days to consider what's in it um, and then hold your oral evidence session. Uh, and again, that will prove difficult to produce any summary of the issues in the written evidence. Um, and that's assuming organisations come back and respond within a very tight time scale. It would also um, probably require one meeting for oral evidence. And depending on what oral evidence you want to take, that could well be have to be an all-day meeting or quite a long meeting. Uh, and again, that runs contrary at the minute to the advice we're being given in the COVID situation, where we're being advised not to hold long meetings. The option, obviously, then is to to do it remotely. But again, 
using the remote system has caused some problems with sound and witnesses dropping out, etc. And I know members have expressed some concerns when scrutinising legislation regarding their ability to do it properly in those circumstances. The department would have to commit to providing written response to any of the issues raised very, very quickly and have to turn that around to a very tight time scale if you were to see their position um, on it. Um, and again, the likelihood is we may have to ask them to do that over at least part of the Easter period to, um, if we run a timetable time that's been suggested. We're likely to have, following that, one meeting to consider the department's written responses and to carry out the informal deliberations with uh, the department officials available. Uh, you would have to then undertake your, reach your position at that meeting on any issues and the clauses. Uh, you'd have to undertake your formal clause by clause the following week, and you'd have to agree the committee report the, the, the week after that. Um, so there's really, as you can see from that sort of time scale, there's no little or no time to discuss issues, get additional information if you need it, um, and or consider potential amendments and get them drafted or ask the department to draft them if that's um, what's required. So really you're consulting a lot of um, work into a very short time scale. Another, um, I suppose, difficulty will be that when we're running at that such tight time scale, it's very likely that the Hansards from the oral evidence sessions and then the informal deliberations will not be available in time for members to have a chance to read them properly before the next meeting, because generally um, it takes nearly up to, up to a week to turn them round. So the likelihood is you will be getting, you, you may not have the Hansards available or you will get them just before the day before the meeting or just that meeting. Um, and that would apply for both the oral evidence sessions and the informal deliberations. Uh, and again, if there is further information required or anything like that, then there's no time really to turn it around. You're going to be looking at very tight time scales. Um, the time timetable won't allow for any slippage or any contingencies. And I suppose the other thing just to highlight is that the impact on the rest of the committee work. If we were to um, support the committee to do um, a committee stage in such a short time scale, then I would have to put all my staff onto that particular bill and that work, and we would have absolutely no capacity to process or work on any other papers for any other um, meeting packs or agendas. We would have to all focus simply on turning that bill round. So all other work would need to be deferred until we'd finished that, that um, consideration. Um, that will obviously create a bit of a backlog because we'll just have to park stuff until we finish that. Um, and it will also impact on the work of the Committal Reform Bill and the Stalking Bill. The Committal Reform Bill, we have provisionally scheduled uh, informal deliberations for the 25th of March, but obviously we would need that meeting if we were to undertake the committee stage of this bill in such a tight time scale, we would need that meeting for the damages bill. So we would have to put that back. Um, and looking at the time scales, once we'd completed the damages bill in that time, you would have to focus all your attention on the Committal Reform Bill as we have to bring it in by the 11th of June. Uh, we've already got the extension for that, so we can't extend again. So you're really pushing most other work back, um, including the Stalking Bill, um, and also if the Justice Miscellaneous Bill is introduced in March, you're pushing them all back until probably the middle of June before we can really work um, on anything to do with those. So it means we can't stagger the approach that we were hoping to do if we had more than one bill in committee that we could focus on particular ones at particular times. We wouldn't be able to do that. Um, I also just think it's, it is worth highlighting that I can't guarantee there's a high risk given these the circumstances we're in at the moment. I can't guarantee that I'll have a full team um, in work for that period of time. I just, I just don't know. Um, and the current circumstances, it's just a risk that we're working with. Um, but I just, I, I wouldn't know. And if we don't have a full team, then the pressure to turn everything around quicker is just going to impact more on whoever's there. So it's just, I just want to highlight that as another potential risk, if you like, that we will manage. But it's just in the current circumstances, you have no way of knowing um, exactly what's going to happen. So um, as I say, it's a committee decision. Um, on how you want to approach it, but I think um, there, you, you do need to recognise that you're likely not to be able to scrutinise it um, um, fully and turn a report around 
in, in that sort of time scale. Um, and definitely the scrutiny or the approach that was taken for previous legislation, such as the domestic abuse bill, um, would not be able to be applied to that sort of time scale. It would be much less um, detailed scrutiny than that. Christine, thank you for um, taking the committee through that. I'll bring in uh, members at this stage. So, Rachel Woods, you have your hand up there. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Christine, for detailing that. It's very helpful. And I suppose, Chair, you touched upon it in your opening remarks. Does the executive have the power? I don't have copies of standing orders or anything with me. Um, but does the executive have the power to decide how long a condensed committee stage is? No. Um, the length of a committee stage is decided by the committee. Um, generally, what happens is once a bill is referred to committee um, after second stage, then the committee assesses how long they feel they need to scrutinise the bill, um, and then they'll put down a motion. So ultimately, the motion has to be passed by the House to extend any committee stage, but the committee will put forward their reasoning for the length of time that they would require to do it. Um, and it's up to the Assembly to pass that motion. Um, so it's not up to the executive to <coughs> agree or, or, or not agree a length of a committee stage. Thank you, Christine. And I suppose then just to confirm that that option is, is very much open to us to decide then on what length of committee stage we would like to have with regard to this bill. Yes, the, the process here, um, 1st of March is when the Minister has indicated for the introduction of the bill. Um, uh, the, her timeline, timeline then indicates one week later for the second stage to take place. Um, should the Assembly then uh, pass it at the second stage, it then that enters into the committee um, consideration stage. It is at that point that the committee uh, would then identify the time frame by which it believes it can carry out its uh, duties, and then the committee would go to the Assembly um, uh, if it felt it needed to have uh, a time frame more than the current standing orders, which is 30 days, um, which is what we've done on the domestic abuse. It's what we've done on committal reform, um, and I anticipate it's what we'll be doing on the stocking bill. Um, so, if, if the committee's view was that uh, you can achieve it within the 30 days of the standing mm -hmm. orders, uh, and members take the view that, that that is doable in light of what obviously the clerk has outlined in terms of the consequences of it then you wouldn't seek an extension in terms of the committee's scrutiny stage. But if you did, then you would go to the Assembly with a date um, whereby you have to then produce your report. Thank you, Chair. No, that, just, that answers my question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Paul Frey. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Uh, this is shabby work from the Minister of Justice. You would think that this lady has not never sat in a committee before. Maybe she just didn't attend, but that's not how a committee conducts its business. And for the minister to say that uh, that the uh, start, as if t to say in her letter that the thirty days provided for an assembly standing orders is like normal practice, it's it's beyond reality. Most, if not all, bills get an extension at committee stage, and rightly so, for the work that we have to do. And then the minister goes on to, dare I say it, say that we could get extra time in Easter recess. This is a diabolical letter. This is one of the worst letters I think I've ever read from a minister to a committee in the 10 years that I've been an MLA. It is atrocious. It is absolutely atrocious. The minister can't have it both ways. She can't talk about repercussiveness and about taking time to consider repercussiveness on an issue around legal aid. And then when we know we know there's repercussiveness issues with regards to this bill and the, the burden that could be placed on the Department of Finance and even the Department of Health for that matter. We need to explore that as a committee. We would not be doing our job or our duty if we didn't explore that. And to timeline us and to even suggest an indicative timeline for the committee, I think is absolutely atrocious. Absolutely atrocious. And remember, this minister has form. This minister put one of her colleagues, party colleagues, up in a, I think it was the further consideration stage of the previous bill to say that the committee should have done more work over the summer. Remember? So this minister has form. This is atrocious. It's shabby work. 
And actually, it's a disgrace. I'll leave it there before I say something too extreme. Thank you, Paul. Is there any other members want to comment at this stage? No? Okay, is, it, is there any members want to advocate that the, min, the Minister's proposal is the way forward for this committee? No? Okay, well, in, in terms of the, the process on this, the Minister will introduce it at, in terms of first stage, then the Assembly will decide at second stage. At that point, it will transfer to this committee, and then the committee will need to uh, decide what the time frame is whereby it can then carry out its work. That will then require a decision of the committee. Uh, if you are able to do it within the 30 days understanding order, um, then that will be a decision of the committee. If the committee is not able to do it at that point, the committee then needs to seek an extension before the Assembly. and That requires, uh, I think I am right, not just a vote but a cross-community vote. Uh, I may not be so sure in, in terms of whether it requires cross-community or not. But it certainly will, re will require the agreement of the assembly to do that. So members will need to take a decision on this. Chair, can I just does this now remove the minister's ability to bring this forward as an um, accelerated passage? That's definitely not going to happen now, or is that still an option that's open? Chair, um, I don't think the letter is clear. I mean, the, the, well, the letter is clear. What she's suggesting, um, I think it's still an option on the table. Uh, nothing to stop the minister introducing the bill and then bring forward a motion for accelerated passage. I don't know whether she's still considering that or not. But so we may not have it. the decision we may have to make. Could be around accelerated passage rather than around the length of committee stage. Just, uh, I'm just clearing that in my own head because I wasn't, I wasn't actually sure to be honest. Well, I'm assuming it's still an option. I don't. Know whether the executive. I don't know what the executive discussed. We're not privy to that. So okay. But her letter makes clear what the executive decided last week, but I don't know whether that's still an option. I'm assuming it is because we're not past the stage where a motion could be put down. She hasn't. The bill's not introduced yet, so there's still that option of putting that motion okay. down in the procedural sense. Yeah, no, I just wasn't sure. But just based on what the chair was saying, I thought would. Well, you know what that wasn't for some reason, or not, but it's it's still possible. It mm -hmm. could still happen. I don't know what way the minister wants to navigate that. If she decided to do it, I, I'm taking from the letter what the executive decision was. Um, I take the the clerk's advice on this that it's the assembly that decides what process is followed whenever a committee stage takes place, as opposed to the executive. You know, there's a clear distinction between who is responsible. There's the executive, there's the assembly, and it's the assembly that decides the process, not the executive. No, no, and I understand that. But what I'm, but I suppose what I'm trying to establish is, then that means, in theory, the minister could still bring to the assembly the the option of accelerated passage, and then obviously, as you said, it'll be up to the assembly. Then I can almost talk. It will be up to the assembly then to to decide whether they will support that or not. Am I right? And, I assume so. <laughs> I assume that's the case. I, 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 I'm just trying to clarify um, myself, whether, I don't know either. You know, whether the minister requires the executive agreement or not for accelerated passage, um, that's not something that I'm privy to. Um, but obviously, she has taken through a executive paper, and the executive has agreed this uh, outworking of it. Um, and that's obviously what we've just outlined in terms of what the consequences of that would be. Um, Sinead Bradley. Yes, Chair, I'm just trying to work out this process myself, and I appreciate what Linda's saying there. Um, there doesn't appear to stipulate anywhere that there was an agreement on accelerated passage, and I'm not sure how bound by that the Minister would be going forward. But in terms of the Executive did make a decision that has been reported via the Minister, I don't really understand the grounds on which they made that decision, and I wonder um, should the committee be contacting the executive? I would have expected the executive to maybe have contacted us, maybe not, you know, or maybe via the minister was the way to do it. Um, but it would be good to know 
on what basis the executive made that decision. Perhaps they just do have that overriding power and committee. I, I just don't know where that is, and I certainly don't think it's in procedures anywhere. Thank you, Chair. Well, it's my clear understanding the executive do not have that authority to dictate the assembly scrutiny processes. It, 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 I'm not aware of this ever happening before in my, my time in the Assembly. I'm not aware of this happening before. And I know what the response would be if any other committee received a letter like this from their minister. I know exactly how any other committee would respond. I would be keen to find out from the Speaker what his view is on this letter from the minister on behalf of the executive, because obviously the Speaker has a role in defending the role and responsibilities of this Assembly and the committees of this Assembly. And we could refer this letter to the Speaker and to the Chairman's Liaison Group, because I'd certainly be interested to get the view of the chairs of every other standing committee, what their response would be if they received this correspondence. So if, if members are, are content that we would seek the view of the Speaker, in terms of um, this correspondence, and we'll also refer to CLG as an item that they could discuss. Uh, ultimately, um, committee members, the ball is in the minister's court to introduce this at first stage. Uh, the assembly agrees it at second stage. Um, it then would transfer to this committee, and the committee will then need to take a decision as to the time frame by which it wants to put through the legislation. So, the committee doesn't need to take a decision today in respect of this, if it doesn't wish to do so. Um, but circumstances will require this committee to take a decision um, should the Assembly pass this at second stage and it moves into a consideration stage process. So are members content that we would raise then uh, to get a view on the Speaker? We will send it to CLG um, and then um, the committee will take a decision on this um, subject to the Minister proceeding with a first and second stage uh, through the Assembly. All members agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Okay, we'll move on. Um, okay, members, item seven was the amendment to the criminal justice sentencing licence conditions. Um, Obviously, members, there was uh, the, the policy intent behind the proposed rule was discussed earlier in the meeting in the closed session, and the committee is able to discuss it uh, further. So, the purpose of the rule is to allow the department to designate organisations other than the probation board to supervise offenders on licence who pose a risk of serious harm to the public. An amendment to legislation is required for a new model to provide the department with discretion to assign the lead statutory responsibility for the management of terrorist-related offenders on licence to a body other than the Probation Board. The legislation will not specify who will perform that role. The Department intends to establish a specialised multi-agency team led by counter-terrorism offender managers trained in using the bespoke risk assessment tool. A business case for the new delivery model is being developed and there is currently no funding in place to cover the annual running costs of a new model. An indicative bid was included. In the financial planning exercise, the statutory rule is subject to the negative resolution uh, procedure. So, members, just to summarise, uh, in terms of the closed session, there were a number of issues that were raised um, by members, um, and uh, that information uh, will be pulled together, and we will be corresponding with the department, seeking further clarity. And upon receipt of that, uh, the issue will then come back to the committee for further consideration. So are members are content we proceed on that basis? Content? Yeah. Okay. Item 8 is the EU exit and justice related issues. Uh, the Minister undertook during the oral briefing on the 19th of January to keep the Committee updated on issues relating to the justice provisions in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement and the wider implications for the justice sector. Uh, the written briefing paper provided by the Department reiterates the Minister's view that the agreement delivers a good outcome for justice, particularly in terms of extradition, surrender, um, passenger name recognition, the exchange of criminal records, access to PRUM, uh, continued participation in Europol and Eurojust, and effective cooperation on mutual legal assistance in criminal matters and asset freezing and confiscation. 
Uh, the UK no longer has access to the Schengen information system, uh, and while the agreement provides the legal basis to allow bilateral agreements with individual member states, this will take some time to agree. The Department aims to influence the UK Government's plans to ensure that Northern Ireland's interests are recognised, uh, with Ireland being the priority member state. The key issues yet to be resolved at the UK level relate to data, data adequacy and civil judicial cooperation. The 2007 uh, Laguna Convention is the substantial fallback position for civil judicial cooperation, and the committee noted the Minister's position that Westminster regs to re-implement the Convention should extend to Northern Ireland on the 17th of December. The Department continues to work with other departments to monitor other aspects of the trade and cooperation agreement uh, that may impact on justice. So if members are content, we will request an update on the outworkings of the Northern Ireland Protocol on the justice sector, and if any additional funding may now be needed further uh, to that required by the police service. Are members content um, with that action, Linda Dillon? Can we just specifically ask, um, in the absence of the successful application to join the Lugano Convention, um, can we get more detail about? You know how this could disrupt the cross-border civil cases. Okay, we can do that. Members content will will ask for that clarity. Okay, so we'll do that and we'll um, request that update on the outworkings of the protocol on the justice sector with the department. Can I just make a point? Yes, Jack? sorry. And it's a political one, but I'm making it. I want the department to be very clear about what the issues are around Brexit and what they are around the protocol. The two things need to be differentiated out, and there shouldn't be any conflation between the two. Okay, we'll include that. Okay, item nine was the draft budget. Um, at last week's meeting, the committee agreed its response in the draft budget, uh, 21-22, which has been forwarded to the committee for finance, the Minister of Justice and Assembly Research. A number of additional issues were also raised by members um, for the Department of Justice and the Probation Board to provide additional commentary um, as necessary. So officials had agreed during the briefing on the 4th of February to provide a written update when the Department had received the responses from spending areas on the potential impact of their draft budget allocations. In the paper dated 16th of February, at pages 27 to 30 of the table pack, the Department has advised that this information is still being collated for consideration by the Minister. The Department also advised that the draft overview and equality impacts have been published online, and these documents were circulated to members on Friday, and they have been included in the meeting pack. The Department has also provided details of its draft 21-22 capital budget allocations, and these are found again in uh, your meeting pack at pages 300 to 301. If members are content, we will request further information on the capital projects that will be funded in each spending area, and also the projects that had been uh, bid for by each spending area as part of the information gathering exercise that will now will, that will not be funded uh, in the 21-22 uh, year. Um, again, further budget information uh, that members had asked for last week will be circulated upon receipt from the department. If members are agreed. Agreed. Okay. Item 10: Proposals to amend the legislation governing the retention of DNA and fingerprints response from the Department of Justice to issues raised by the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. At our meeting on 15 October, the Department uh, of Justice officials provided oral evidence to the Committee on the outcome of the public consultation on proposals to amend the legislation governing the retention of DNA and fingerprints in Northern Ireland. Following that meeting, the Committee agreed to request the, the views of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission on the Department's proposed way forward on the retention of DNA and fingerprints. The committee considered the Human Rights Commission response, uh, which, raised a member, uh, which raised a number of issues and concerns at the meeting on 17 December, and agreed to forward it to the Department for a response. The committee also agreed to forward it to the Northern Ireland Children and Young People's Commissioner for views on the issues uh, raised regarding children. Having considered the response from the Children's Commissioner at the meeting on 14 January, the committee also referred it to the Department for a response. Um, the Department has responded, indicating that it is disappointed that the Human Rights Commission does not think the proposals go far enough to comply with human rights law. Uh, based on advice from the Departmental Solicitor's Office, the Department believes that including maximum retention periods based on the seriousness of the offence and a meaningful review process will ensure that the proposals comply with the findings of the 
uh, Gochran uh, judgment, uh, and it is not minded to revise the proposals further from the changes that were made to the initial proposals following the consultation. Uh, the intention, therefore, is to include the relevant provisions in the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. The Department is due to respond to the issues that were raised by the Children's Commissioner on the uh, 23rd of February. So, members, if we are content to consider this response further when the response to the issues highlighted by the Children's Commissioner is also available. Unless there is further information needed, we will consider it when we have the Department's response to the Children's Commissioner's issues. Okay. Content. Um, correspondence, seven items um, of correspondence uh, in the pack. I'll draw attention just to a couple of them. Uh, one of the items was item six. It's correspondence from the British Association for Shooting and Conservation and the Northern Iron Firearms Dealers Association requesting an opportunity to give a short presentation to this committee on the Police Service Firearms and Explosives Branch Policy decision to introduce an application process and fee for firearms magazines without prior consultation, which the organisations are challenging on the grounds that it is not compatible with the legislative position. The Committee considered previous correspondence from Basque and the Firearms Dealers Association on this matter and agreed to request a response on the issues raised from the police. The response will be circulated when that is received. So, If members are agreed, we will forward the additional correspondence now to the Department of Justice for its views and comments on the policy change in the context of the firearms legislation, including the fees and transaction structure agreed as part of the Justice Act of 2015 and 16. And just to inform members that these organisations have been invited to a meeting with the Police Firearms Explosive Branch to discuss solutions to the issue that is taking place um, next uh, week. So, members, if you are content, um, we will uh, provide that further correspondence to the Department of Justice. I understand there was a meeting this week um, as well. Uh, and obviously, upon receipt of further information, then the committee can consider in more detail at that point any further actions that may be necessary. Members are content on that item. Item 8. There is a letter from the Minister advising of her decision to increase the sentence for a number of serious driving offences, including the causing of death or uh, serious injury, uh, by dangerous driving or careless driving while one under the influence of alcohol or drugs, or two failing to provide a sample from 14 years to 20 years to reflect culpability or harm. The Minister has also decided that a maximum of a uh, discretionary life sentence should be available for these offences where an offender has a previous conviction for that offence. So, members, this um, area was one of a number of areas that have been consulted upon as part of the review of sentencing, in which this, the Department had previously advised it would brief the committee on the full proposals. The Minister's letter indicates that the briefing is due before Easter. However, the Department has not uh, included it in the forward ro pro work programme at this stage. So, members, it is there just for noting at this point. Uh, item 9, in terms of correspondence, there is a letter from the Minister advising that she has asked the Prison Service uh, Pay Review Body to publish their report on the pay of operational prison grade staff for 2020 uh, today. Um, the report recommend recommendations were approved by the Minister of Finance on the 12th of February. So, members, it is there for noting unless there is further clarity uh, that is needed. And we will duly note item 10 uh, is. A Sajini report on a follow up review of how the police use discretionary and penalty notices to deal with low level offences. That review has identified improvements in police governance and oversight arrangements, and good progress has been made to implement the recommendations of the original report. So, members, it is there uh, for us to note. Uh, item 11 uh, is a letter from the Minister providing an update on the current position regarding Hyde Bank Wood and COVID 19. That letter was circulated yesterday evening, and members are asked to note the position in respect of that matter. If members are content, we will action the other items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet. Unless there are any comments members want to make on that. Yes, Mr. Can I add, just uh, with regards to the letter we got there for, about the prison grades pay settlement, uh, there is still an outstanding issue around police staff pay. That is an annual thing. It always seems to be that they are lagging behind every time, and it is getting later and later every year. Uh, I'm wondering if we could seek out information around that, the police staff uh, pay settlement or increase, if that's possible. Yeah, we can add. Uh, my understanding is that settlement was approved right, okay. um, recently um, and backdated to 
April, I think it was. If it has been sorted, that's I haven't spoken to anybody's last number of weeks, to be fair. So if it has been resolved, then, then all well and good. We'll, ch- we'll check on that. I do think it has been, but we, we, we'll check on that and come back to that next week once we get information on it. But I do Thank think you. that was dealt with. OK. Um, Chairman's Business, just advise members that I, along with the Deputy Chair and Linda, met informally with the Lord Chief Justice this morning, and we did discuss a range of issues. Um, the Lord Chief Justice uh, is willing to attend a meeting of this committee, um, which I would like to do before the summer recess, and we will work to identify a suitable date, because the Lord Chief Justice uh, is retiring come the 31st of August. So it would be beneficial for members just to, to hear from him uh, in respect of his role, uh, not just as the Lord Chief Justice of the courts, but he's also chairman of NIJAC, which is the Judicial Appointing Authority um, whenever it comes to the judiciary. Um, so it was a constructive meeting, Linda. Yeah, no, it was a very good meeting. And just to put on record our thanks to the Lord Chief Justice for facilitating it. Um, I think it is important that we get him in front of the committee, particularly to get his view around the committal bill. I think that it would be important that we we hear what he has to say. I thought that, you know, whilst it was only a very brief discussion, I think it's important that the committee get an opportunity to to put that issue in particular to the Lord Chief Justice. So I think that the, the, probably the sooner we can get him, the better. But certainly before the chairman made the point in the meeting, and I think he was right, we, we, he has set the tone in terms of coming to the committee, and we would like to think that the new person who's appointed will will follow in his footsteps in terms of coming to the committee and engaging with us. Yeah, no, he did. The, the Lord Chief Justice set that precedent quite a number of years ago when justice was devolved um, and has appeared in front of quite a number of different justice committees. Paul Frey? Yeah, not to prolong the meeting on issue reform, but just as a previous justice chair, can I, uh, during his time, a uh, tenor in, in, in place, can I just say that it's the first time I've heard that he is retiring? Uh, and I would like to put on record to wish him all the best. He's always been very respectful to me. He's always afforded me a lot of time, uh, even as a Justice Committee member, not least when I was chair. Uh, uh, I'm sad to see him go. Uh, I'm glad that he, you know, um, I'm always glad when people retire so they can enjoy their life. Um, but I will wish him all the best. And he is, I will repeat, he has always afforded me the time and the courtesy and the respect shown to this committee. So. Uh, just to thank him. Well, should have the opportunity to do that in person. So, um, we, we will seek to get the, the meeting organised. Um, it may be that, um, uh, and, and potentially, I think the committee may want to write um, to the Lord Chief Justice on the committal reform to get a view in writing, um, because our time frame has that concluding um, probably before we're going to have him in front to. of this committee. So, even if we were able to get a a written response Mm -hmm. in terms of seeking a view, I think that could be um, instructive for members in terms of what his views are on that. So we we will write to him in respect of that. Um, He mentioned the presiding district magistrate. Um, I think it's Fiona Bagnall in terms of our meeting um, around some of the views in terms of the the committal reform. So uh, in any event, let's write to him to, to get a view on that at least that we would have that in writing. Um, is there any, before I go back then to um, the stock take item, is there any other business? Okay, well then we'll go back to agenda item five and then once that's concluded members, then that will be the, the meeting over. So hopefully we have officials then with us um, for agenda item five. Um, if I can just check, are the officials able to hear us um, from the department? Chair, we can hear you. Can you hear us? We can. Now, we can't see you, so I'm told if you're able to switch off and on your technology, um, that should give us a visual, um, which shouldn't interrupt things. Um, So if there was a way just to reset that so that we could get a visual, because I know this has maybe been now a recurrent issue with the Department of Justice for the last two months, that every time we have a, a... presentation it's a blank screen that we're able to see but just an audio so can I let you um, reset that and hopefully it'll it'll come through with a visual okay chair we'll try again thank you we're going to try leaving and rejoin it
Okay, so that that looks like it has worked in terms of being able to, to have a visual, so I appreciate that. So um, just again, very quickly, members, to, to remind you then, um, this is around the stock take of policing oversight and accountability. And um, I think we're being joined by uh, Moira Campbell and Lisa Bowles, so I'm going to hand over to both of you at this stage. Thank you, Chair. Hopefully you can see us and hear us now. Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Uh, and thanks very much indeed uh, for giving us the opportunity to brief the committee on where we are with the stock take of policing oversight and accountability. And as you know, this work is moving uh, a bit more slowly than we'd originally intended. Um, and that's just in light of the other pressures, both on our minister and on uh, our main stakeholders, including yourselves, of course. Um, and although there's no shortage of other demands on everyone's time at present, the minister does remain keen to take forward the stock take. She's conscious that the current architecture for oversight of policing has been in place for around 20 years now, and it's also coming up on 11 years since responsibility for policing was devolved. So she considers it's timely to review how the current arrangements are working, and in particular, she sees value in looking at the relationships between the various bodies and how they interface with each other, just to see where there may be areas for improvement, scope to eliminate unnecessary duplication, or where there may be a need for greater clarity. Uh, the Minister has been clear that this is not about making any radical changes to the existing bodies or structures. Uh, the draft discussion paper we shared with you advises that any changes that are agreed should be consistent with the ethos of the, the pattern report. So in other words, this is not intended to be pattern mark two. The discussion paper sets out draft terms of reference for the stock take, provides an overview of current roles and responsibilities and highlights issues that have been raised with the department in recent years, along with the key developments we've seen in Great Britain and the Republic of Ireland. The paper is still very much in draft form and is intended as a prompt for discussion. So we're not setting out any firm proposals at this stage. Uh, the paper covers issues such as ensuring clarity of roles, whether there may be scope to streamline the provision of information by the PSNI to the various oversight bodies, um, how we oversee the implementation of recommendations made to the PSNI, the operation of the tripartite relationship between the board, department and PSNI, and the department's sponsorship role. Uh, alongside the draft discussion paper, we have also shared with you the Police Ombudsman's five-year review report. We thought it made sense to consider her recommendations alongside the matters being discussed through the stock take. And I should stress these are the Ombudsman's proposals and the Minister will want to consult before taking a view on her recommendations. The Minister has so far been holding a series of meetings with some of the key stakeholders to take initial views on the stock take and next steps. She so far met with the Chair and Vice Chair of the Policing Board, with the Police Ombudsman and with the Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice. She's also due to meet with the Chief Constable and with the full membership of the Policing Board. And she does plan to meet with the committee at a suitable juncture. The next stage in the process will be for us to develop a draft policy paper for further discussion with this group of stakeholders. And once we have a final paper, we intend to consult more widely, uh, including with uh, stakeholders representing police officers. We plan to take forward those proposals on which we can achieve a broad degree of consensus. We will, of course, keep the committee updated on progress and will share with you our proposals in advance of any public consultation. Any proposed legislative changes would, of course, be subject to the normal process of consultation and scrutiny by the committee and the Assembly. And it would be the next Assembly mandate before we'd be ready to bring forward draft legislation. In summary, then, this work is still at an early stage, and that's because we want to take the time to give the issues raised proper consideration and to ensure there's full consultation with all relevant stakeholders. We're open to considering any thoughts the committee might have on how and when to engage with you on the next phase of work. And we're happy to take questions or comments on how we're planning to take this work forward or indeed any other matters that members would wish to raise. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Moira, I suppose I'd, I'd be interested if there is any emerging um, you know, themes at this stage of the process. I have my kind of own views uh, as to some of the areas that, that I would be keen to explore uh, without necessarily saying that's my definitive positions on things. But uh, is there anything from the initial work that has taken place um, coming through that's, that's of note? 
I think in both the discussions we had in the preparatory phase at official level and in the discussions the ministers had to date with, with some of the, the key bodies, um, the sorts of things that have been coming through is um, just sort of an agreement that we shouldn't rush this, particularly with everything else that's going on. So people are broadly happy with the, the pace at which we're, we're taking it forward. Um, we, we did see that there's a lot of support for the current architecture. We weren't getting the sense that anybody thinks that um, there are any fundamental um, issues with how the arrangements are structured. Um, which is why we focused in this iteration of the discussion paper very much on the interfaces and, and relationships and ensuring people are working in a, a complementary fashion. Um, an issue that came up a few times is just ensuring this clarity between the respective responsibilities. Um, you know, for instance, the, the interface between the policing board and the justice committee is something that I know you've, you've discussed yourself sometimes during, during meetings where uh, one responsibility ends and, and the other starts. Um, there's also uh, been a theme about the potential for maybe more informal cooperation between the, the respective bodies. Um, and to be honest, we start to see uh, some of that happening. And I think because of the discussions we've, we've been having, uh, there already have uh, been some um, sort of fairly informal discussions taking place during the autumn, I think, between some of the key inspection bodies, just to, to compare notes on what their intentions are for areas that they, they wish to look at. Um, Another key theme coming through is that um, the police receive a lot of recommendations from various bodies or even from reviews that the Commission themselves, but maybe an area we could look a bit more at is how well are those implemented and what impact are they having and are we clear enough on who has responsibility for, for overseeing how that works. Um, I think there was a general um, feeling that we're not seeking in any way to dilute the accountability of the police, but there may be scope to work smarter in how we do that. Um, so streamlining the, the demands on the police in terms of the, the uh, various requests for information that come through uh, seemed to be an issue where there was a fair degree of consensus as well. Uh, and just in, in terms of um, time frame, um, I think it's looking at the moment like um, we'll be hopefully meeting with the, the full board with the minister um, this side of the summer, but it, that would mean it's probably going to be the autumn before we'd be in a position to get to a, a public consultation. But I think in between times, we're going to want to look at this in an iterative way. Um, at this stage, it's been more about scoping out what should be included. Um, I think once we get to the next stage, we're going to be looking at actual what, where we might be making proposals and what the options for those are. So they may, we may want to go back to people, uh, and I think we've reflected that in the, the, the draft handling plan at various stages, so that will impact really our, our time skills later on. Okay, thank you, Moira. Let me bring in some members. Just Emma Rogan has indicated. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you, Emma. Thanks, Chair. Um, I have a couple of specific um, questions for um, Lisa and Moira, if possible. Firstly, have you ensured the term reference um, are clear that this is not a fundamental review? I think we've, we've sought in the discussion paper to make that clear. So in the introductory section of that and in the executive summary, uh, we make the point um, that we're not seeking to um, really set aside the changes that have been made uh, on foot of the, the patent review. So we're not trying to, um, it's not a review of the, the policing bodies themselves, it's more about ensuring that um, the, the roles are operating in a way that's complementary and where there may be any um, duplication or, or a lack of clarity that we want to seek to address that. Okay, thank you. And my other question is around um, in the papers that it, it says um, a review of the um, police ombudsman's powers. What exactly um, does that mean? I, I know personally myself with the um, the lack of limited powers that the police ombudsman has um, with regards to retired officers, compelling them to give evidence in, in investigations, what that can actually mean um, in terms of, of investigations. Um, what does that review of the police ombudsman, what does that look like and, and what, is, what is meant by that? So in the legislation that um, created the office of the police ombudsman, there's a statutory requirement for the ombudsman to undertake uh, a review of her powers uh, on at least a five-yearly basis. 
Um, and the process for that is she um, conducts that review and then puts her proposals to the, the Minister of Justice. Um, so we've taken receipt of her report, uh, which we shared with the committee. And given that we'd already been planning to do this work through the stock take and we'd be engaging with largely the same stakeholders, uh, we thought it was a good opportunity to, to look at both in, in parallel. Um, so the Minister, before she reaches any views on those um, recommendations been made by the Ombudsman once in her discussions with uh, the various bodies to, to give them the opportunity to, to give their views on the report. Um, I think that the Ombudsman herself also has plans for uh, a process of engagement with key stakeholders, so she'll be talking directly to uh, other interested parties as well. Okay, thanks, Chair. That's all my questions. Okay, thank you, Emma. Linda Dillon. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you for, for that brief in the presentation. Emma's kind of covered it, but I just want to clarify that the issue around whether this is, is a review or a stock take. So, paragraph 3 on page 48 said, clearly says stock take is not intended as a fundamental review of the rules. But if you go to paragraph 6, it looks very much like that's exactly what it is, a fundamental review. So, just saying it's not a review in an earlier paragraph <laughs> doesn't make it not a review if you then put it at, add in another paragraph that does what it looks to me like to be a review. So I'm just I'm just wanting to, to clarify that this is a stock take only and not a review, not a fundamental review. And it talks sorry, I'm I'm probably going on here and you're only looking for the paragraphs, but you know, it talks there about um looking at developments in the 26 counties and, and Britain and identify lessons that might be learned to inform arrangements for here. So it's not in a, not a review of the arrangements, but you're looking to change the arrangements without a review or potentially ch change or alter the arrangements. It's just, I'm content with the stock. I think paragraph and I'm content with six was intended to note that um, in looking at the issues that um, are within scope of the stock take, we, we want to be mindful of any sort of relevant developments in GB or Scotland. So we're, I don't, I don't think we were, sorry, England, Wales or Scotland, I don't think we were, or the Republic of Ireland, I don't think we were sort of suggesting that um, this stock take would be as fundamental as some of those reviews have been. Yeah, I just, I just, I just want to clarify that. I mean, to, to look at what's happening in other areas could be done as part of a stock take. Um, to actually change something here as a result of that, as part of a stock take, would not be. I don't think that that comes under the remit of a stock take. That that is a review. That is actually changing things. So it is a stock take, but it's just noting that there's the other developments happening in other parts of Great Britain and in the Republic of Ireland. And it's just you know, is there any learning? There may not be, and it may not be. It may be that the changes that are being are so radical that it's beyond the scope of what we're trying to do here. But it's just in. For, for for completeness, just to note that there's been so so many changes in the last twenty years to how place and regions are set up in England, Scotland, and in, in the Republic of Ireland. And it's just to be aware that those changes are happening. They may not, they may or may not be relevant to the situation here. Given that we are generally content with the the broad architecture that's in place, but are, are there any dynamics in terms of how bodies interface with each other that are happening in England or Scotland or? The Republic of Ireland that might be useful here, there might not be, but it's just to see if there are any lessons. But we are quite clear that this is just a stock take, it's not a fundamental review of the diff of the, the arrangements. Okay, so I think it's it's more there for context. So Annex C of the discussion paper sets out anything we've been able to glean from, from what's happening elsewhere. Um, and in some cases, you know, every every jurisdiction is starting from a different place. So in, in some instances, what has happened in other jurisdictions has actually brought them a bit more closely into line with what we have here. Look, that, that, that's fine, Chair. I'm, I'm content with that. Okay, thanks, Linda. Uh, Rachel Woods. Thanks, Chair, and thank you for the presentation and the briefing paper. I just have three questions, I suppose, um, and maybe maybe the four more of a comment. But just with regard to the ombudsman's powers and reviews, the 
report and reviews that the um, police ombudsman has already provided to the department. It says in the paper that it's provided three reports on recommendations, but they've not been acted upon. Could explain why that's happened? What has happened previously is when um, the department has consulted on proposals and uh, taken uh, proposals to the executive, um, there hasn't been a consensus at executive level for those to be taken forward. Uh, and I think it's because they've gone as a package and some of the uh, some of these recommendations, I think, are, are relatively straightforward from the Peace Ombudsman, um, but some will be more politically contentious or there will be a range of stakeholder views on them. Um, we thought that the stock take was a good opportunity to see where there were areas that could be capable of achieving consensus, because I don't think there's any point in trying to put forward a package um, that we know will not be accepted or not be able to, to go forward. Uh, that we, and we'll not be able to legislate on any proposals where we don't get a uh, sufficient level of uh, consensus at the executive level. Okay, so going forward, I say even just with without this stock take, is there any um, consideration being given if there there's going to be the police ombudsman making recommendations? And I appreciate the report that we have, and there's quite a lot of them. There's thirty five or thirty six, um, and then coupled with three other reports with recommendations that haven't been enacted upon of separating out the ones that, you know, and actually make it, maybe get some movement in light of the recommendations. I think the, 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 current, the, the current report from the Ombudsman sort of builds on the previous recommendations that have, that have been made. She's noted in, in her recommendations, you'll see whether it's a new recommendation that the current Ombudsman is making or whether it's been an existing recommendation or one that she's updated or tweaked slightly. So we think that kind of cover the, the current report that we've got kind of covers the recommendations that have been made previously because they're all kind of broadly similar in the recommendations that have been made. So this is kind of picking up the ones that haven't been addressed and newer ones that the current trauma one has brought to us. Okay, no, I think yeah, I appreciate that. But in terms of if we've got a list of recommendations and okay, granted we might not be able to get political consensus at the exec executive for all of them as a package. Uh, is there consideration going forward to do something with the recommendations that might be able to get consensus, or do they have to go as a package? I I think the the issue previously was being able to do anything on any of them was that they were presented as as a package, and I think this time around it might be more sensible in deciding what proposals go forward to a public consultation to get a sense from stakeholders of where, where we may be able to um, get agreement that something is uh, worth considering. Um, that way, we don't end up in the position we're in before of, you know, the best being in the, the enemy of the good and trying to do everything that you end up not being able to take anything forward. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. I just appreciate that. It's just, you know, I think it would probably be quite frustrating if you continue to make recommendations and there was never any movement on them. I mean, it would be a pretty pointless waste of time there. Um, so certainly be um, looking looking forward to, to discussing them. Um, I suppose in terms of the stock take then again, are budget allocations considered as part of this and the effects of budget cuts um, on, on the relationships between the justice agencies and the impact of that? Is that forming part of it? That isn't something that we're intent to have within the scope of this exercise. Um, there's work going on separately uh, within the department looking at um, the um, feedback we've been having from the various organisations on what they anticipate the impact of uh, the proposed budget will be. Um, I, I don't think it would be sensible to try and bring that into this exercise. I think that merits um, it, its own exercise and given the time scales as well, decisions on budgets are going to need to be taken much more quickly than we're anticipating to bring forward this, this stock take. Okay. Finally, um, just in terms again with the whether or not it's in the remit of a stock take, um, is the, or the scope of it, is there any discussions being had or being looked at on um, diversity and people we have within justice agencies, be it criminal justice agencies or oversight boards, and how training is looked at, how understanding of say minority groups, BIME communities, um, is any is any of that being looked at? 
It, it isn't something that's been raised to date. Um, I think if we were to um, look at those issues, we'd be starting to look at the actual bodies themselves. So it's not something that's been proposed to date. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rachel. I'm Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the presentation date. Uh, just note on point 14, just one quick point. Um, you know, you talk about is, uh, the stock take and all the different partners and they're quite exhaustive in, in the list that's provided. But then in point 14, um, it speaks specifically to the Police and Northern Ireland Act and the opportune time that this could be an opportunity for changes. Is that anticipating that the stock take will uh, raise issues that are embedded into the Police Northern Ireland Act. You know, it seems a very specific final place or destination for the outcome. Um, and I just wonder why has that area been singled out? Thank you. I think it's probably because it's really that act that gives effect to the current architectures of the tripartite accountability relationships. And um, also it, it includes things like the, the role of the controller and auditor general in undertaking reviews of continuous improvement. So uh, the types of issues that are, are coming up around um, the, the respective responsibilities around oversight inspection, um, any changes, if there were to be changes made, um, that, that would be the piece of legislation that we're likely to be looking at. Okay, thank you. And and do you anticipate anything? I know you said there could be um, areas that come up that wouldn't require legislative change, but do you anticipate that being the broadest place where you know this whole conversation is going to lead? Because I, I, I see, for example, you mentioned even this committee having a role in it. You know, and um, I just wonder, do you anticipate anything beyond that, or should are there other pieces of legislation that should be flagged up? Um, because it seems to be such a broad conversation, to my mind, from the outset, and then it very quickly refines to that, just that one act. I think, I think that's something we could usefully look at, actually, because um, if, as part of a, a consultation, we were um, looking to amend some of the, the police ombudsman's powers, which may be contained in a separate piece of legislation, there may be a need to look at that as well. So I think we could maybe yeah. I think the book, take a look at that. The bulk of the police ombudsman powers are in the 1988 Act, and then the, the legislation around the police and the board are in the Police Act 2000. But there are other, I mean, the license to powers versus Jenny are in other pieces of legislation. So they were just flagging like the current regions in, in relation to the police and the board. So that part could be expanded out better, but we, we can look at other, we're willing to look at any other legislation that needs to be looked at, given, depending on what issues are. Arise and are great. We'd be happy to look at it, yeah, the potential to clarify this because, as I said at the outset, this is a, a kind of a living document and we've been updating it as we go in light of the, the discussions and feedback we've been having. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that because it does, uh, you know, hopefully, you'll see how it would alert somebody to looking at that thing. Is that the starting point and we're reversing from there um, and building a, an engagement around that? So, I would really appreciate that broader spectrum yeah. to be better understood. Thank you. Thanks, Sinead. Paul Frey. Yeah, Chair, thank you. Thanks for your presentation. Can I ask, what does it mean to be an officer of the Assembly and who actually holds that designation currently? Um, the Public Service Ombudsman is set up as a. Yeah, I think uh, Nipso, the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman, maybe has that designation at the moment. Um, we would need to look at the specifics of what that would mean for the Ombudsman's Office if there was a consensus that that is a direction that we, we should go in. We haven't done any detailed work to date on what, what the implications of that would be. So, so you don't actually know then what additional powers of any or circumstances that that would then place on the Ombudsman, Police Ombudsman? I think the main difference it would change would be who the officer reports to. If the officer, if the, if the officer, if the officer became an officer at the assembly, she would report directly to the assembly. Where currently, um, her reports come into the Minister of Justice because the, uh, the office, the office is independent, but it's set up as an arm's length body as a department. So it means that currently, you know, the officer provides her reports to the Minister of Justice, and the governance arrangements are, are provided through the, the Justice Department. Where if it, I think if it was to be set up as an, an officer at the assembly her reports would be directly to the assembly, they wouldn't be that same 
directing to a minister. Yeah, it's recommend it's recommend that session one. Sorry, just on your on the Annex D uh, page. Um, I'd be interested to know more about that and who actually uh, enjoys that designation presently, and then what it means for them. Uh, obviously, it's maybe as you say something to do with oversight. So we're really looking at who places the places place, if you know what I mean. So. Uh, at the minute, I th I, my understanding is it's the Department of Justice, but then that may then fall to the Assembly. But then what does that actually mean? Because you still have to then uh, you have some department to account for that, or, or maybe not. Um, so it's about accountability of the police ombudsman's position at that point and, at the, and their office. Uh, recommendation, I think it's... Three. Recommendation three. The police ombudsman legislation should provide for disqualifications from holding the position of the police ombudsman's persons who are or have been serving police officers. Why would serving police officers, or sorry, retired police officers, not be qualified to hold a position like the police ombudsman? Uh, I think in her report, the the Ombudsman highlighted the fact that um, this is different from um, what would be the position in, for instance, Scotland. Um, so I think she was sort of looking at experience elsewhere and um, making the recommendation that uh, she refers to the concept of civilian oversight. Um, this surely, is one of her new recommendations. Um, surely. So that Surely a retired, a retired police officer is a civilian. I think it's probably to do with perceptions of independence that somebody who's, there, there could be an argument that somebody who's previously served with the police wouldn't necessarily be independent enough for the police to be able to carry out an investigation. That's an argument she's put forward, but obviously the Minister will want to consider all the arguments <coughs> in relation to that. Any of these proposals as to whether or not that would go forward or not, but I think that would be an argument would be around perceived independence of the office. So, so that would then imply that anyone who served in the police, whether it was for one month, two years, or thirty years, would be barred from holding the police ombudsman's role. Does that sound fair? <coughs> I think in, there are a number of roles uh, and public appointments where there are certain disqualification um, provisions and in, in general terms those are included really to ensure that there isn't any perception of any kind of conflict of interest on the part of the public. Um, but we're not at this stage um, proposing that these recommendations are accepted or rejected because the Minister hasn't yet taken a view on, on any of them. Um, we've just taken a receipt from, of them from the Police Ombudsman and are in the process of, of taking views on them. And, and, and I've got, I understand that, of course. And just to be clear, does, do you read that as being a police officer from anywhere in any jurisdiction throughout the world? Or is that specific to Northern Ireland police officer? I think that would have to be... If that proposal was to go forward, that would be detailed. That would have to be determined whenever, whenever any legislation would be being drafted, whether it would apply to Northern Ireland or would apply to police officers from across, from further afield. Yeah, uh, it's it's not a recommendation I am comfortable with at all. Can I, can I ask? Uh, and again, I know it's not I know it's not yours, and, and nor have you made a decision on it. So you know, a caveat that. Can I ask? Do you know of any other disqualifications? Uh, with regards to holding the position of police ombudsman, uh, sorry, police ombudsman's positions. Uh, I, think when, I think there are various qualifications provisions for the relevant complaints bodies in England and in the Republic of Ireland. I think in England they do include previous previous police officers from from that position, but I'm not sure of the detail. We just need to check. But I think there are, for the likes of the the police complaints body in England, there are disqualifications that you could sit as the chair of that body. So, what I mean by that, it, with regards to Northern Ireland Police Ombudsman, so, for instance, can criminals, some, somebody with a, a criminal past, can they become Police Ombudsman? I think the current legislation has various disqualification provisions to around people with things like crim certain criminal convictions and bankruptcy and those sort of standard things that are sort of part of the normal public appointments process. 
Okay. And usually in a public appointments process, there would be a requirement to disclose any previous convictions, uh, adjudications of bankruptcy, and anything of that in that order. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, Gordon and then Linda and then that's us. Gordon Dunn. Right, thanks, Chair, and thanks for the presentation. Just a couple of things on a general point. I suppose members of the Assembly are I suppose, somewhat frustrated when it comes to accountability on, on policing. Uh, as MLAs, who obviously talk about members that are not the policing board, the role of the Minister, is there any review or any thoughts to review of the role of the Minister in relation to accounting to the Assembly on policing? Um, whenever it's raised, very quickly the Minister would say, well, the Chief Constable is responsible as the operational role for policing, and I'm not in a position to answer that. Is there any thoughts on, on a review of that in relation to, I suppose, accountability um, of policing to the Assembly? I think if we were to look at that, we would be getting into the territory of, of Patton, and because that's part of um, what lies at the heart of the tripartite accountability arrangements, which are there to really designed to um, ensure the operational independence of the chief constable. So that was a, a fairly fundamental principle of Patton. Um, so it would it would be, I think, we, we would be going beyond a, a stock take and then do a fundamental review if we were if we were to look at that issue. Yeah, yeah, I think it is something maybe should be reviewed at some stage. I think things have moved on, and, you know, how things have settled down. But it, certainly those members um, that are not in the policing board, and I appreciate there are members on it who probably cover a lot of the issues, but so many things come up short notice. And we, you know, we want to get a quick answer and want to raise it with the minister. And, and I'm not aware of the chief constable, for example, coming before the assembly. Certainly in my time, I'm not aware of it. Now he has come before the committee. But, but is there anything to stop him from coming before the assembly that you're aware of? Or are we going outside the remit of your your review? Well, I can answer that one. There's no there's no rules. Nobody can come before the assembly apart from assembly members. Nobody. But I mean, yeah. So that that. Okay. Our our ministers, I suppose. Right. The um, public engagement thing. Um, any thoughts on increasing public awareness, engagement of all the structures that you've talked about, the tripartite arrangement that you've talked about? Uh, any thoughts on increasing public awareness and public engagement? A lot of them are good institutions doing a good job, but the public are they're not aware, and an awful lot of the public are not that interested. But is there any thoughts on increasing the public awareness in relation to? whole issue of policing and how the business is carried out. I, th I think that is something that we, we will be looking at and um, I think it was the Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice who suggested that maybe some kind of um, public facing document that set out the roles of, of the respective bodies um, in, in fairly straightforward terms to the public might be, might be useful. Um, members of the public don't tend to want to trawl through the, the Police Act Northern Ireland to, or, and then like 2000 um, to, to, to understand uh, what the various responsibilities are. So, for instance, um, you know, the minister gets a lot of correspondence from people where we end up having to signpost them to, for instance, the police ombudsman if it's a complaint about the conduct of the police or to the chief constable if it's an operational policing matter, um, which is, I'm sure is frustrating for people because they, they expect that the minister has a particular role and uh, we, we have to advise them that um, some of these matters aren't necessarily within her gift. Okay. So uh, we have um, started ha having to think about um, whether there's something we could produce that would provide a bit more clarity on what the policing accountability landscape actually is. Um, so that that is something that I think could be a hopefully a quick win from the stock take. Good, good. Just my last point. In paragraph uh, 24, you talk again on the tripartite relationship, which you're very keen on. You talk about in the middle of 24 that there is a shared interest and responsibility, but not always control and visibility. Is that a general comment about the various uh, stakeholders within the tripartite arrangement, or is 
anything specific in mind there. Um, that there's there's a lack of responsibility and, and control and visibility. So about the middle of twenty four there. Yes, sir. Just quickly reading that. Probably is some frustration. Yeah. Sometimes it, we don't always see to call business cases or whatever coming in from police constable that just making sure that everybody just has the same information about big business cases or payments or things like that. Yeah, because uh, under the what's known as the management statement of financial memorandum that uh, governs governs the relationship between the department and the police, there's sometimes a requirement um, for some types of spend um, to be um, remitted to the, the policing board for review, but sometimes matters just come straight to the, the department. Um, and we have been having some discussions with the board in, in recent times about whether the balance is right there because there might be some things that they, they have a legitimate interest in, um, which maybe wouldn't be immediately apparent to, to the department when something comes into us. Um, equally, we don't want to flood the board with um, every business case or, or pay remit or uh, request for a direct award of contract that, that comes to us because there is, uh, the, the, there is quite a, a big volume of, of material there. So we, we thought that this was an opportunity to, to look at um, what visibility maybe the, the board needs that it isn't getting, um, or whether there's a, a better way of um, flagging the issues that they may have an interest in. Um, there's also issues around the visibility of the end-to-end the -end processes. So for instance, um, the, police, the policing board see matters come to the department, which they feel seem to sit with us for a long time, but there may be other processes that are, are required, for instance, um, spend of, uh, that is beyond our delegated limits or is novel contentious repercussive. Sometimes there's a need to, to go to the, the Department of Finance and there can be a bit of turn and fro on, on issues until we get them resolved. Um, so I think that those were the sorts of issues that we were trying to capture there. Okay, that's grand. Thanks very much for the information. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Gordon. Linda. Chair, I hope Gordon was asking that question about bringing the Chief Constable to the Assembly in a moment of madness and it's not party policy. Because I can't think of anywhere in, in these islands, England, Scotland, Wales or, or the whole of Ireland where you would think that it's appropriate to take the the Chief Constable, the Head of the Policing Service, in front of the the government or the devolved assembly. Um, there is an accountability body there. It is the board. We all, everybody in this committee, apart from actually Rachel, have members on that policing board who are able to hold the Chief Constable to account. And I do think it's important that we have um, political representatives on that in terms of holding it to account. I do think that it's Certainly, I mean, maybe I'm biased. I was on it, so I, I would I'd be open to being charged with being biased. But I do think it is a very useful body, and I've said that here before. This committee could not do the work that the policing board does in terms of the accountability, and I think it works for for both sides. It works in terms of the board and and holding PSNA to account, but it works for PSNA in terms of. You know, using them as as we should be used as a committee, and all our committees should be used as a sounding board for for ideas and and sort of getting a a view which may be reflective of wider society. And it, that goes to something that that Rachel actually raised earlier on, um, in terms of representativeness, particularly from the BME community within all of the structures. And it's it's a point I actually raised about the policing board, because it's not representative may well be representative in terms of religious background, but outside of that, it's not. And, and that is an issue that, that we do have to look to address. And we have new communities and a very much more diverse society than, than we have had in the past. And I think that every organization should try their best to be reflective of that. And I'm not accusing the policing board of not being trying to be. It's not reflective. That may well not be through any fault of theirs, to, to be fair. We all know the challenges we have in trying to recruit people onto, onto any kind of a, a board. It's not easy. So I, I, I just want to flag that up. But I think that it would not, under any circumstances, be appropriate to be to be bringing the Chief Constable. Just to respond to one of the issues that was raised by Paul, I think if it, if it gives you any confidence, Paul, in terms of the 
who could potentially be police ombudsman, the level of vetting that you have to go through, you and I would struggle to get through, never <laughs> mind anybody with a criminal record. It's, 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 it's DV vetting, as they call it, and it's, it's extreme level of that and it's just you would you would really have to not have a parking ticket not have any kind of a, a record i think to be able to get through that that and process me, yeah. and, <laughs> and then just in terms of those who have previously been police officers i think where that's potentially an issue and it's not even around legacy it's much more recent than legacy if you were a serving police officer five years ago and the incident you're investigating happened six years ago and you happen to be not even necessarily directly involved. It's, it's very difficult. That that's a difficult. And there's one. You know, it's different in a committee where we can say, "I need to recuse myself from this issue. I, I have to declare an interest." But the, how does the police ombudsman do that? Who who steps in there? It becomes a very complicated issue. So, I think that's where you could potentially. So, I think those are the circumstances under which you would have to to look at it. That then probably doesn't impact police officers from outside this jurisdiction because they will not be, have been involved. Although I think you would have to look to, would you have to exclude police officers from outside this jurisdiction who have been involved in investigations? So we know we've brought in outside services before. I'm, I'm just flagging it up, I suppose, as potential issues, but um, I, don't, I don't think you'll have anybody who's, who's of any kind of dodgy character getting the, the role. OK, thank you, Linda. Um, Moira, um, can I thank you both for joining us? Uh, obviously, um, it's an interesting area um, that you'll engage with the committee further in, in in terms of how this is going forward. I appreciate it's uh, a slow burner in that respect and there's more work to be done, but um, we appreciate the update um, that you've brought to the committee today, so thank you for that. Okay, members, that concludes today's meeting. So thank you. Um, to my, or the meeting will be today week at 2 o'clock, room 30 and via the Starley facility. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme